a new life from the most impossible place, a grave. Nonetheless, he's here. Impossible, impossible. Yesterday, what looked like his failure was literally set in stone. But this morning, that stone is no longer where it was, and everything has changed. Everything has changed. The enemy has been beaten, crushed, really. The celebration of what he pulled off Friday, it's over. How did this happen? He was lost, but now he's here, right in front of me. I didn't know it was him. Who would? But if it is, if it's him, it changes everything. It changes who I thought he was. It changes who I thought the enemy was. It changes me. He is risen. Morning all. Well, it says it changes me. So, well, it looks as though I'm in charge this morning. And happy Easter to you all. And let's celebrate the truth that Jesus is risen. So we've got some responses to say uh, on the start of the order of service. Let's share together in these words. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Death could not hold him. The Lord is risen. The way to heaven is open. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, looks as though I've got to do everything here this morning, so we're going to sing a hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Let's sing.
Good morning and welcome to Midsummer Norton Methodist Church as we share together in this act of worship. The service has already started by my uh, standing there, I say. What a surprise that might have been to you. Well, we're full of surprises this morning. This is Easter Day, a day of surprises, a day when those disciples and those women who had seen Jesus die weren't expecting anything. But the biggest surprise for all of them was that Jesus rose on that third day and he's alive and he's with us. And even though we're not gathered together today in this act of worship here in this building, yet we're joined together by God's Holy Spirit as we worship from our homes. So let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God our Father, we celebrate and praise you, that you are the God for whom there is no endings. You are full of surprises. And we thank you that on Easter Day we can celebrate that Jesus is alive. He has risen from the dead. And that you raised Jesus from the grave, bringing us victory over death and giving us eternal life. We thank you, O oh Jesus, that for us and for our salvation, you overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. We thank you, O oh God, that death no longer has dominion over us. That is not the end. But for those who believe and trust in you, there is the promise of everlasting life. And we thank you that you come to us so wonderfully this morning. Thank you that you have given us this wonderful day to celebrate that Jesus is alive. Thank you that you draw alongside us, even though we are separated from worshipping here in this building. You come to us in our homes, in our gardens, wherever we find ourselves, you are risen. Buildings cannot hold you, just as the tomb could not hold you, so buildings cannot hold you and the power of your love. So we celebrate this Easter day, that you are alive, that this is a day of hope, this is a day of glory, and to you be all praise and glory now and forevermore. Amen. And then some words of a prayer of confession, and I invite you to share with me in these words. If we have fallen into despair, Lord, forgive us. If we have failed to hope in you, Lord, forgive us. If we have been fearful of death, Lord, forgive us. If we have forgotten the victory of Christ, Lord, forgive us. A moment of silence as we confess anything else to God that we need to bring before him, knowing that we can have victory over sin. And as we offer ourselves to God in that sense, we are able, for those who truly repent, to receive his forgiveness in these words. May the living God raise you from despair, give you victory over sin, and set you free in Christ. Amen. And so it is indeed Easter Day as we celebrate this wonderful, glorious uh, news. Um, just by way of a couple of notices which I want to uh, give as we are gathered together. Um, I announced in the notices, what, two weeks ago, um, that today our children and family worker, Hannah, 
is finishing her uh, appointment and we wish her well in uh, the future. Um, if she's watching, we want to say thank you, Hannah, for all that you have done amongst our children and family, not just those within the church, but especially those outside of the community. We hope when we're gathered together back as a church in this building, we might be able to do something a little more, shall we say, tangible, uh, but here this morning, on your last day of work, we want to say thank you for all that you have done. And obviously, given the current situation, uh, we're not able to make a new appointment at the moment, but we will be looking uh, towards that in the future. And the second thing to say is, <clears throat> given the current coronavirus situation, um, I've had a number of um, tweets and uh, emails and things from our Methodist relief organisation called All We Can this week. And it just uh, caught, draws to mind that um, there are thousands, millions of people across the world that cannot, for example, wash their hands because there's no clean water. And all we can work with projects that help people in those situations. So we're going to give a financial um, gift to all we can, um, to start off with something like £500, and, and then we shall continue to support them through this situation in the weeks that months have come. So let's give thanks for what we have because we recognise there are millions of people around the, the, the world that don't have even clean water to wash their hands with. So notice he's over and um, I understand, um, here he is, let's just see. Morning again. Uh, morning Will, uh, you've been busy I hear. Well yes, I had to start the service because you were late. I was late? What do you mean I was late? Well, you weren't here to start it, and I had to start the service. Well, I'm very grateful for you. Um, I, can't, I don't know whether they can see this on the live uh, stream, but you'll notice that uh, Will has already been at his Easter eggs. You can see a bit of chocolate on his tongue uh, just there. Uh, well, it was very nice. It was good breakfast. So, how many Easter eggs did you have for breakfast then, Will? Well, just the three to start the day off with. Right. And, uh, well, actually, I had some very festive breakfast as well. What was that? Well, I had, and I'd save this especially for the occasion, because I had mince pie flavoured porridge. Yuck! Well, I enjoyed it. <laughs> no, that was you speaking then. <laughs> uh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> And uh, uh, it was lovely uh, in that way. Right, uh, it's testimony time, Will. And uh, we've had two people uh, email us uh, to tell us something about what God has been doing in their life uh, this week. So let's just uh, look at these and uh, just share uh, what people have been saying about God at work in their lives. Yeah, time for that then. Right, so the first one is from Judith and Simon. I like Simon. Why do you like Simon? Because he laughs at your jokes. Yes, he does tend to, doesn't he? Yes, that's quite uh, true. So just for Simon and anybody else, uh, in fact, this particular one is just, this isn't part of the testimony, by the way. This is, Will, uh, you've been doing a bit of research, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yes. So here's the first joke for Easter Day. I'm thinking of setting up a houseplant business. See why it's for Simon. I'm thinking of setting up a houseplant business. I hope everyone is rooting for me. Yuck! That is terrible. Uh, well, let's try this one then, uh, shall we? Doctor, doctor. I think this one is for Catherine Robinson, by the way. Doctor, doctor. I keep thinking I live in a supermarket. Oh, says the doctor. How long has this been going on? Well, I replied. <laughs> You're talking now! Yes, I am. <laughs> How long has this been happening, uh, the doctor said. Well, I replied, ever since I was little. Yes, I can hear the groans from here. Don't get any matter, does it? Hey, I realised the last time you wore this jacket was on Christmas Day. Uh, that's very true, actually, Will. 
hey, I can, <laughs> now you're talking. <laughs> hey, I can feel a piece of paper in my pocket. No, not the Christmas jokes again. Let's not have those. Let's go straight to the testimonies. Right, let's go straight to the testimonies. So we were back at Judith and Simon. Here we are. Um, they write this. We have spent many moments counting our God-given blessings. We and our family are healthy. We still have our jobs and our employers are still paying us, even though we are not working as much. It did not rain when we had a new roof put on part of the house last week. We have learned, or tried to learn, new technology to be able to join in the Lent study group. We feel very connected to our church family through the live streaming of services. And the list could go on. Our blessings are endless. This week particularly, we have appreciated being able to worship together on Monday, Thursday and Good Friday. Simon would normally have been at work on those days. And we have had that precious resource of time to be able to reflect and focus on Holy Week as probably never before. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. Thank you, Simon and Judith, for those words. And then we have uh, one, uh, we have uh, a testimony from Marjorie. Has she arrived yet? Don't be cheeky. That's not good, Will. Not good at all. Right, uh, Marjorie writes this. Nearly all my life I've been subject to deadlines. At school, homework to be completed. At college, assignments to hand in. When teaching, lessons to prepare. Events to organise and responsibilities to carry out. In general and church life, minutes to write, services to prepare and deliver, people to visit, meetings to attend, get-togethers to be organised, cakes to make and meals to be cooked. She sounds very busy. She is very busy. So now at this particular time, I would like to say thank you God for your gift of time. Time to take stock to sit in the garden and enjoy the sun, to take short walks each day and chat with people in their gardens and notice the spring flowers on the way, to catch up with unfinished tasks, to enjoy leisurely telephone conversations, to learn how to use modern technology like FaceTiming and Zoom, and to read books and have time for hobbies. And most of all, to have time to reflect, to pray, and to draw closer to God. That's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, that is brilliant. And so, out of this situation at the moment, um, Judith and Simon and Marjorie, and I'm sure many others, are now developing a different rhythm of life. And we're seeing that perhaps there is more time to get closer to God and to learn from him by reading our Bibles, by praying, by perhaps listening to podcasts or um, other uh, recorded services, and we're able to share together in this wonderful way of getting to know God more closely. And so I encourage you all to do that as part of our Easter Day uh, response, is to come before God and to read his word, to get to know more about him. I had an email after Good Friday from somebody who said they never realised um, other angles of both Monday, Thursday and Good Friday, but this opportunity had given them time to reflect and to listen again to these stories. Well, that's brilliant, isn't it? That is brilliant, Will. Well, now, Will, we're going to listen to God's word. Um, well, I've been up early, so I'm going for a nap. I all Right, you're going for a nap. So we're going to read from Mark's Gospel and chapter 16. Mark's account. We've been following Mark's account through this week. And we're now at chapter 16, the story of the resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, 
had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. We thank God for his holy word to us. And in response to that account of the resurrection, we're going to sing uh, two songs of Easter uh, praise. The first one by the power of modern technology is uh, See What a Morning, and then we shall move into Thine Be the Glory.
And so having celebrated his resurrection in song, so we come before God with our prayers for others. Let us pray. In the risen power of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we come to pray for others. On this day where, as a Christian church, we celebrate and we are joyful, so it is in that context of that Christian hope we pray for those who are in need. We continue to pray for our world at this moment as this pandemic continues to spread. On this very day, we pray for all who are ministering through our health services, through a variety of ways, key workers, to those who have caught this virus. We pray particularly into our hospitals for those who are working there today, for those who are struggling with this virus, to those relatives who cannot be with their loved ones at this most important of times. Lord, will you give to them a sense of your comfort and strength at this time? And to those working with these people, we pray, Lord, that you would keep them safe. And we thank you for the skills and gifts which they use on this day. And we pray in a wider context for those who are having to make decisions, for governments, for those in management, in health services and in other places, that you would grant to them your wisdom in a situation that we've never known before. May they rely totally upon you for their wisdom. And we pray for other needs in the world. We pray for those countries who, who were mentioned earlier on, who do not have clean water, and yet the pandemic is spreading across their areas. And we pray that through the work of such organisations as All We Can, that they might know God's touch on their lives, to bring hope out of despair. And we pray for those we know, who are in need at this moment. For those who are feeling vulnerable, for those who are feeling lonely, for those who are struggling with mental health issues, for those who are in abusive relationships. Lord, at this time, in all of those situations, May your peace be felt by those people. And as we pray for them, so on this day when we declare the wonderful truth that death is defeated, so we thank you for your promise of eternal life. And we thank you for the faithful who have departed from this life, who now see you face to face in glory. And thus, we are able to declare that death is not the end. You are a God who raises the dead and lifts them into glory. And so as we begin this new week with all its potential, with all its possibilities, though we are in a very different context to what perhaps we would have hoped to have been in this week. We pray that like Simon and Judith and Marjorie, we might all find a new expression of you as we draw closer to you, as we have more time for relating to you. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who gives us time. You are the God who gives us some wonderful things. As we are out in our gardens or as we look out of our windows, 
we can see you in so many things. And so may we continue to draw close to you. For we ask these things in Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Then we have our second reading for this morning, which is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians is basically a response to a number of issues which they have had in this young, fledgling um, church. And in chapter 15, there are those who have clearly been saying in this church that the resurrection never happened. And so Paul responds to that with these words. So chapter 15, verses 12 to 20. <clears throat> but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. We thank God for his holy word which speaks to us. And before I reflect on that, we're going to sing another hymn which speaks not only about Easter Day, but also the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, in Christ alone.
And so I want to take for our reflection this morning that verse in Mark's Gospel in chapter 16, where in verse 6, the young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, says to them, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Over the years, many sayings or expressions have crept into the English language, and we are not quite sure of their origin. We just perhaps say them. An obvious example would be when we talk about our thorn in the flesh, which are actually words of St Paul from the Bible. A less obvious one is when we say perhaps, he's the apple of his mum's eye, which is actually based on words of Deuteronomy. Well, the other day I found myself using a phrase that neither myself or the person hearing it knew what it was from, and so I had to Google it. The phrase that I said was, all shall be well and all shall be well. And I was referring to the fact that we will get through this current coronavirus pandemic and all will be well. So my Google homework discovered that the actual quote is, In the end all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things will be well. To which apparently Oscar Wilde is reported to have added, And if it isn't well, then it's still not the end. So who said it? And I can imagine for many of you now, you're racking your brains as to where it has come from. In the end, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things will be well. Well, it was said in the 14th century by Julian of Norwich, a 14th century mystic who is credited as being the writer of the earliest surviving book in the English language to be written by a woman. She wrote The Revelations of Divine Love. This book recorded 16 visions she had where she experienced visions of her Saviour's divine love based upon his passion. So I want to base our thoughts this morning on that concept. In the end all shall be well and all shall be well. And all manner of things will be well. It's virtually interchangeable with these words of this young man at the tomb. Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. And I want to suggest this morning it speaks to us into two contexts. Not necessarily exclusive. The first context it speaks to us is that this is Easter Day, the day of resurrection. Our text and other gospel writers record for us angels or Jesus himself speaking to people post-resurrection to assure them that all is well. Don't be afraid is one phrase which is used. The words of Julian of Norwich express what we celebrate in the resurrection of Jesus. Belief in the resurrection. Belief that God raised Jesus from the dead constitutes the very ground of our Christian faith. Everything else we believe in as Christians is grounded in that truth. As we believe God did raise Jesus, then not only can the rest of Jesus' message be trusted, but we can also then live with the ultimate consolation that the end of our story has already been written and it is a happy, ecstatic ending. We will, in the end, live happily ever after. That has already been written because of the resurrection. For you see, what we believe in as Christians is not based on wishful thinking or natural optimism. It's based on the word and promises of Jesus and the trustworthiness of that word. And those promises is guaranteed by the resurrection 
of Jesus. When we believe this, we can live with un without undue anxiety about anything, confident that the end of our story is already written and that it's a happy ending. Thus we can say, all shall be well, and all shall be well. We see this in a wonderful example, this kind of belief, in an example uh, that I read about through Archbishop Desmond Tutu, one of the key figures in opposing and eventually ending apartheid in South Africa. Amid the struggle to bring down apartheid, facing every kind of threat, he remained steadfast and even joyful in the face of threats and overwhelming odds. What anchored him in his steadfastness and joy? It was belief in the resurrection. Occasionally on a Sunday morning when he was preaching, soldiers would come into the church and line up along the aisles with their weapons in hand, hoping to intimidate him. Tutu, for his part, would smile at them and say, I'm glad you've come to join the winning side, for we've already one. In saying this, he wasn't talking about the battle over apartheid, which at that point was still far from won. He was talking about the resurrection of Jesus, the definitive triumph of goodness over evil, which assures that in the end, goodness will eventually triumph over evil, love will triumph over division, justice will triumph over injustice, and life over death. Knowing these things, we can live in confidence and hope. It will end well. Not because we wish it, or because things are looking that way for us, and we've created that. It will end well because Jesus promised it would. And in the resurrection, God backs up that promise. Hence, there's nothing to fear, nothing, not defeat, nor threat, not loss, not sickness, not even death. The resurrection of Jesus assures us that in the end all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. He has risen, he is not here. All shall be So that's the first context in which this text speaks to us this morning. And our second context is our current context with us living with the corona pandemic around the world. But we need to remember that the very first Easter was not in a crowded worship space with singing and praising. On the very first Easter, the disciples were locked down in their house. It was dangerous for them to come out. They were afraid. They wanted to believe the good news they heard from the women that Jesus had risen. But it seemed too good to be true. They were living in a time of such despair and such fear. If they left their homes, their lives and the lives of their loved ones might be at risk. Could a miracle really have happened? Could life really have won out over death? Could this time of terror and fear really be coming to an end? Alone in their homes, they dared to believe that hope was possible. That the long night was over and morning had broken. That God's love was the most powerful of all, even though it didn't seem quite real yet. Eventually, they were able to leave their homes. When the fear and danger had subsided, they went around celebrating and spreading the good news that Jesus was risen and love was the most powerful force on the earth. This year, we might get to experience a taste of what that first Easter was like, still in our homes, daring to believe that hope is on the horizon. Then, after a while, when it is safe for all people, when it is the most loving choice, we will come out 
they gather together, singing and shouting the good news that God brings life even out of death, that love always has the final say. So you see, this year we might get the closest taste we have had yet to what the first Easter was like, especially for the disciples. And so the resurrection speaks into our context of living through this coronavirus pandemic and also our context of the resurrection grave. In the end, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things will be well. And that's not just wishful thinking or blind optimism, but based on the promise of Jesus. We go back to that text which this young man said to the women, Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. To which in verse 7 we're told, There you will see him just as he told you. He promised it. Now it's been fulfilled. You will see him. Resurrection brings to us eternal hope in so many contexts. And remember that those words of Julian of Norwich were from a supernatural experience of God through those divine revelations of love based on the passion of Jesus. And they can be our experience today. Whether we call ourselves Christians or perhaps we're just searching at this moment. Perhaps we're searching for hope. Perhaps we're searching for meaning for life. The resurrection says to us, all shall be well. Don't be alarmed. This Jesus who was crucified, maybe in your own thoughts, wasn't an option, was dead. But now he becomes an option. He has risen. He is not here. He's out in the world, ready for anyone to form a relationship with him as the risen Lord. And that could be you this morning. Your Easter could be transformed by coming to our Lord Jesus, who, yes, died on the cross, but the tomb cloths here remind us that that was not the end that Jesus is risen. And when we come and follow him, all indeed will be well. All shall be well. And all manner of things will be well. Don't be alarmed. This Jesus who was crucified is risen. To which our response to this glorious truth this glorious promise. As we began our service this morning, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Death could not hold him. The Lord is risen. The way to heaven is open. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that your promises are true. We thank you that you said you would rise from the dead, and you did. And you gave us so many other promises about how you would be with us forever. You gave us promises that when we ask, we will receive when we ask in your name. And so this day is a day of joy and hope and celebration. And we pray that as we respond to you, whether that be for the first time or once again on this Easter day, we may respond to you in full confidence and hope. Because Jesus is risen. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Want to say?
say that if it is this morning that perhaps this message has touched your life, and if you want to uh, engage in a conversation with me about that by email, please do, nsmminister at btinternet.com. For others of you, you might have some words of testimony over this coming week. Please do email me them so that we can share them in next Sunday's service at 10.30. And so we continue our celebration as we sing this great hymn, which is based on those words of St. Paul we had earlier. He has risen. whose glory you raised Jesus from the dead. Strengthen us to walk with him in his risen life. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
be upon you and remain with you this day, this Easter season, and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>